about privacy, surveillance, and cryptography. <laughs> All this actually boils down to privacy itself. Surveillance and cryptography are sort of side things that come off this. So I'm going to tell you how mathematicians violate privacy. They can do it in three ways. They can do it directly. They can do it indirectly. Or they can do it out of plain stupidity. I'll explain how each of these sort of work. <laughs> so we'll start at the top, because even though the top is the most serious, it's also kind of the most obvious. When you're directly violating someone's privacy. I'm about to say that. <laughs> so we can design tools that violate people's privacy in a very large scale. We're taking it away. So I'm talking about mass surveillance now. So there are various you know, government organizations around the world that build very large, complicated systems to take in lots and lots of people's data. GCHQ in the UK is a good example. They're the largest employers of mathematicians in the country. In the US, their counterpart, the NSA, is the largest employer of mathematicians there. So these are places where mathematicians go and do work. Start with a particular example. Which is, a couple of years ago, it, it came out that the NSA and its, its counterparts, what's done through the NSA, were able to read 35% of internet, of encrypted internet traffic. That's 35% of encrypted internet traffic. Now, how, how do you do that? Because it's encrypted. Well, they were, they were very sort of clever about this. So, what they figured they could do was make an attack on the discrete logarithm problem. So, I'm not sure if you've heard of the Diffie Helping Key Exchange. The idea is as follows you have a prime number. We have some, uh, so I'll call this, um, pick some constant chosen E. And then you have two teams, two people, Alice and Bob, and, sorry, this G. What they do is they each pick a secret number, little A, little B. And they agree on these two public ones, the prime P and the constant G. B sends to A, G to B, quad P. A sends to B, G to the A, quad P. And then they each compute G to the A, B, quad P. And they have a shared secret. So A knows to the AB might be, B knows to the AB might be. They're transmitting over an insecure channel, so everyone can read P, G, G to the B, G to the A, but it's sort of fairly well understood that this is a difficult thing to, to reverse engineer. If you just have these pieces of information, that's not enough to recover these. Well, sort of. So Two parties try to communicate secretly, will exchange information, and then use these shared secrets to employ another cryptographic technique. Okay, going on so far. The best known attack on this cryptographic exchange is called the number of fields seed. The basic idea is as follows. To compute A and B, you basically need to do a discrete version of taking logarithms. We need discrete logarithms. Okay, so how hard is it to, to actually do this? Well, some other missions sort of figured out that, that the challenge, say, is, is, is this hard, this much of which 
is making a, some sort of lookup table for the prime p. And this time time sliver here uses g to the a g to the b. So most of the work is developing a lookup table for the prime p. Huge amount of work. Okay, so I think if we if feel pretty big enough primes, the thing is safe. But you can't sort of use any old prime number here. You need to pick a prime p such that, if I get this correctly, is it p minus 1 and 2? Do I need, Toby, do I need this? Is prime or is not prime? I think, it, I, I think it needs to be prime. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's lots of non-primes. So I need P minus 1 or plus 1, I can't remember which one it is. You need P minus 1 or 2 to also be prime. <coughs> so you can generate big prime numbers, but then a lot of them get, get, get knocked out. Because if you don't have this, then this problem becomes much easier. So it takes about a minute to generate a prime number on, on, on your laptop. And a minute's a long time. No one wants to wait a minute to, 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 to send something with a message. So what we decided was, well, let's just fix a prime p in some sort of implementation. Mm. So I think Apache was one of the big ones here. So the coders ran this thing for a minute and got a nice prime number, and then hard coded it into the into the, into the implementation. What does that mean? Well, you fixed your p, and millions of people are using the same p. So now you've got a, a, a soft spot to attack. So now, if millions of using this prime p, if I build a lookup table for this prime p, then the problem becomes much easier. And actually, this part here, we could do in this room with a couple of hours of Amazon cloud server time, cost over 50 bucks, provided we've got this lookup table. So this is the hard part, and this is the easy part you can do. All the difficulty is packaged up here. But the NSA realized that, that if they built a big enough machine and ran it for long enough, they could compute this lookup table for a given prime. I'm sorry, I think that's in 24. Now you can't just run this in a stupid way. You need to know exactly how this algorithm works. You need to optimize everything to the hilt so that when you build your machine, which costs about $200 million, then it does produce this lookup table in approximately six months. What happens? About, there are about six prime numbers bouncing around that are being very commonly used. So you build a $200 million machine, you run it for three years, you now look up there for the six most common primes. And that gives you 35% decryption. Okay, so. This is what they claim they can decrypt. Is that? Once you've got the lookup table, you and I, if we had this lookup table in our pocket, you and I could do a decryption of someone's communication, take a couple of hours on Amazon, uh, hiring an Amazon cloud server. The NSA has slightly more powerful computers, they can do it in real time. So this is 35% decryption in real time. Message gets sent, I just read it. <coughs> okay, but maybe you think, well, okay, the NSA can read our stuff. What does this, what does this really matter? Well, it kind of does, because not only do you have the issue that, that, that people think they're communicating in an encrypted way, but they're not, and we'll discuss this more a bit later in the lecture, but you have now a, a, a vulnerability in, in society itself, because this lookup table, once you've produced it, now exists. It's sitting somewhere on some hard disk somewhere. And this thing is not very big. By not very big, I mean sort of... Just on the order of gigabytes. Fits on a USB stick. So what happens if you've got this magical tool that can be used to decrypt a third of internet traffic? What might happen if it fits on a USB stick? Off it goes. 
You can't secure something this big. No matter how hard you try. Especially if you need to access it however many trillion times a day. Maybe you can lock it in a vault and put it in a barrel and bury it in the, the, the Mariana Trench. But if you need it, then it has to be accessible. But am I, am I just sort of philosophizing here? Is this actually a realistic thing that could happen? Could, could, such a, could such a thing leak? Well, a couple of years ago, something similar to this did leak. The NSA had developed some exploits for Windows operating systems. It's called Eternal Blue. This information was very small. It was the order of 27 kilobytes. Now, if you think a couple of gigabytes is hard to keep safe, what happens if something's a few, uh, with a few kilobytes? That into the public domain. It was a cache of exploits the NSA built for Windows operating system. That cache was then used by some backyard hackers, believed to be North Korea, to develop the WannaCry malware, uh, ransomware. Who's heard of WannaCry? Yeah, shut down bits of the NSA. Uh, the, um, the NSA. <laughs> I wish it shut down bits of the NSA. <laughs> Justice. <laughs> shut down the Peugeot factory in France, shut down delivery companies, shut down all sorts of things across the board. And people said, oh, we have to blame these hackers in wherever the hell they were. I don't mind that. This is for Windows operating systems, I believe it was uh, Windows 10? number of recent-ish Windows operating systems. It was just Windows from what I understand. Problem is all these large corporations were implement were using Windows. So you have this problem that, that you've got this cache of, of exploits. It takes these companies time to develop patches and then to push the patches out. Not everyone, I mean, you know, who here always makes sure that their Windows operating system is completely up to date 100%? You're lying through your teeth. John, I'm a friend of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Even better, but some people do use it, they're stuck with it. So, so there are these systems that are hard to patch. All of a sudden, hospitals, you know, the, the, the doctors and nurses get there in the morning, they turn on the machine, and there's a big sort of screen of death saying, pay us two Bitcoin or, we'll, or we won't give you your um, uh, access to your hard drives, encrypted the drive. Back then, two Bitcoin was only about $600. Now it's about $20,000. You can't protect something like that. If you start building in fragility and backdoors into important parts of society, you have to expect that one day it's going to come back and bite on the ass. And that's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. There's no reason to assume that this couldn't leak as well, because it fits on the USB stick. If it's very big and hard to move, like a nuclear weapon, that's a bit different. You can't quite sort of gently sneak out of there. That <laughs> 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 right, but this thing just... It could be, because there's a giant sort of hole in the, in the shelf where there used to be a, a, a nuclear weapon. But they still lose them. <laughs> <laughs> but you can only detonate a nuclear weapon once. This thing is the gift that keeps on giving. This you can detonate again and again and again. This is, this, this is the important part. And actually, the, micro, the, 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 the head honchos at Microsoft said losing Eternal Blue was like misplacing Tomahawk missiles. That was the sort of damage they were comparing it to. Huge amount of damage, completely responsible. And one of the people who developed Eternal Blue an interview and said, yes, the people who did this should be should be should be you know, chased out and held to account. And I was amazed that it was coming out of his mouth. I mean, this was you, you idiot. You you made these exploits. You worked on this. You can't just blame the person at the end of the chain. Because not everyone can do this sort of stuff. I don't know about you, but I haven't got two million bucks in three years to spend. Maybe you do. I don't know. I forgot to buy Bitcoin back in 2010. And I had, they would have had 20 million bucks in three years to spend. 
So this is what I mean when we're deliberately violating privacy, constructing things with the explicit intent of ripping <coughs> apart people's secure communications. You knew what you're doing. Absolutely deliberately. There's no vagueness here. Oh, well, actually, we thought we did. We like to factorize numbers. We like to make them numbers. No, you don't. It's us. <laughs> you want to break into someone's encrypted internet traffic. I'm sorry, that's what you're doing. There's no ambiguity here. <laughs> On a similar line, the National Institute of Standards, NIST, it's called NILS, they make, publish various sort of standards and protocols for how you might want to do cryptography, random number generation, stuff like this. They published a certain standard for random number generation based on elliptic curve cryptography. I'm not going to go into the details, I might do it at the end of the lecture if you want to hear the actual math details of what happened. I'm out of time. But basically, they came up with an elliptic curve and said, here's a nice elliptic curve. I mean, just sketch it out briefly. So, a lovely elliptic curve. It's an equation y squared equals x cubed minus 3x plus b. This plus 3x plus b. Where b is 56 digits. Okay, you're taking rational points on this curve, and you could put a group structure on this. I'll explain this at, at, at the end of 5.30. And they said, okay, well, to do random number generation, we're going to take two points on this curve. So, y1, sorry, x1, y1, and x2, y2, we'll call this p, and x1, q. And each of these also has, you know, about... 60 digits. And then you do some sort of multiplication and raising the powers that you can generate random numbers. So people said, oh, that's uh, interesting. Um, where did you get these, 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 these PNQ from? And this responded with, oh, you know, just someone. <laughs> it's like, no, but you, yeah, yeah, just trust us, it's all fine. Trust us. That's the key here. Because sort of reverse engineering the random number generator is the same as finding alpha such so that alpha p equals q. I haven't given you what the group structure is here, but I've got ways to multiply points on the uh, rational points on, the, on, on this curve. So we have no idea. Where the NIST knew this, but they gave no proof or no even evidence as to why these points were, or why this B was a good B to use, and why these were two good C points, random number generation. They just said, trust us, it's fine. At which point the cryptographic community said, okay, this, we, we, we can prove one thing from this, which is that of all the, of all the points you might want to use, definitely don't use these ones. <laughs> Definitely don't use these. Because they lost trust and faith in these, organ these government organizations because they were deliberately ripping holes through our cryptography. Deliberately doing it. So if you've got, the, if there exists this alpha, so, so, wait, sorry, this alpha does exist because this group structure gives you a cyclic, uh, cyclic group of prime order. But the point is that finding the alpha, alpha should be hard. But if NIST, in conjunction with the NSA, knows this alpha. Then, well, alpha's not a good number. If that leaks, it breaks all the cryptography that was used from this random number generator. And random number, secure random number generation is crucial to build cryptographic protocols. If you can't generate random numbers, you're screwed. You might as well write your letter on it and put it in an envelope and post it. In fact, that would be more secure because then some poor schmuck has to sit there and like, open a letter and read them all the time. They can't bulk read six million of the a day. We are the ones creating all these tools. I people tools. The US has just finished building the storage facility in Bluffdale, where they like to keep stuff. But it's the NSA. They like to keep a lot of stuff. How much stuff are they keeping? About 10 to the 19 bytes. 
so far. That's going up. 10 exabytes. <laughs> That's 1.5 megabytes for every living person. And you use various kind of compression algorithms to make sure that obviously you want to be using this cleverly. You don't do this by accident. You don't build a 1.0. It also costs 1.5 million dollars. You don't do this by accident. You don't accidentally build a 10 exabyte storage facility. You do it for a reason. You want to do it. This is going beyond mass surveillance. This is called total surveillance. The number of words estimated to have ever been spoken by humans throughout history is 5 by 10 to the 18 bytes. So this is literally big enough to record every word ever spoken by any human ever. Twice. This is not an accident. This is what I mean when you deliberately surveil people. 